All right, um, so the last bit we're going to talk about here just relates to formalizing a little bit of the, of the algebra, I'll say, that we use for special relativity. And this, um, so I'm going to explain it more in, in uh, a matrix and, and vector, like column vector matrix notation here. And so if you've had a linear, a linear algebra course and you're used to using, you know, vectors and operators, like think of like big A as your matrix operator, um, it will all look really natural to you. If not, a lot of the, the kind of the layout that we're using will be applied to quantum mechanics here in a few weeks. So um, it, it's, you know, really it's, it's the, a way of doing mathematics using, you know, nonlinear terms is, is ultimately, or not, I wouldn't say nonlinear terms, but um, you'll see what I mean. So. We're gonna uh, first of all look at the um, our Lorentz transformations, and recall we have x equal. At, we'll do it x prime equals gamma times x minus v t. We have y prime equal y, z prime equals z, t prime equal t. And I'm going to do something here. I'm going to put ct, ct prime. Uh, and that's not even right because in that case there, this needs to be c gamma times this. Uh, and by the way, if you notice here, we can distribute that c to be ct. We can distribute the c there so it just becomes beta times x. So let's do that. Gamma times CT minus beta X. And so what I want to do now is let's make a matrix where we have our vector X, Y, Z, and CT. These are my, it's my uh, column, it's, it's a column vector with four component, four components now. And I want to find some matrix, a four by four, of course, matrix, and I'm gonna call this eta. That's the generic name I'm gonna to give to it. That's not curly n, it's eta. And I want for that to spit out some result, x prime, y prime, z prime, ct prime. Now, just as a, as a quick uh, reminder, the way that this works, there are four entries here row, and for a row vector, sorry, column vector like this, you flip it on its side, and you take the x element there times the first element up there, y times that, z times that, ct times that, and then you add them all together, and that's what your x prime is. Same thing, then you take the x times one of the second row, y times that, z times that, ct times that, that gets you y prime. So, we can work this out pretty easily. And let's look, first of all, at the second and the third one. These are the trivial ones. And hopefully, if you've seen matrices before, you can immediately tell that both of those are simply um, unitary one diagonal terms. So I'll leave those there. We have a one there and a one there. And everything else in this line is zero. So when you take that, flip it. You just take y, turn it into y prime. On that one, you take this, flip it, you take z, turn it into z prime. So everything else there is a zero. Oops. And those two lines are quite easy. And the other thing is notice that for the x prime entry, we don't see any mention of y or z. So that means that both of those coefficients have to be zero because when you flip it, if that was anything other than z, you would have a y term in there. And then same thing for the ct prime entry. There can't be any y or z coefficient. Same reasoning. So it really comes down to just identifying exactly what four factors there on this seemingly symmetric matrix, or almost symmetric, we'll find. So the easier way to see this now, if it's not entirely clear, let's just distribute the gamma and we'll directly see what coefficients have to fall in each of these columns. And remember the first row will give us the x prime variable. So we just have gamma x minus gamma vt. 
So let's go ahead and just put gamma there, and let's put gamma uh, minus gamma v. And then down here, remember ct is already there, so ct is already there. It's just gamma ct, and maybe I'll just put parentheses around it to be entirely clear. That's just one variable. So it's a prime. Minus gamma beta x. So easy is gamma. Oops, sorry, that gamma needs to be here. We take gamma sine times ct. So it's a gamma there, and we have a minus gamma beta. So both of these off-diagonal entries are minus gamma times a velocity. Now, in one case, it's minus gamma v. In the other, it's minus gamma beta. We're saying v over c. Now, just real quickly, if we're working in units where c is 1, again, assuming our units are exactly matched, in this case here, if c is 1, it actually is exactly the same thing. So once you, once you identify the proper units and you take off the shackles for the, the dimensional analysis, then those two just become exactly the same, and it is, in fact, a fully symmetric matrix. Um, there's one more thing this matrix is, which we won't get into it, um, but it is unitary, which means it preserves lengths. What those lengths are is a, a different story. Um, so this is, in fact, our, our, what we call our, well, it's a, the matrix that you transform the x variables to get the x prime variables. So this is, yeah, I mean, it's the, the Lorentz transform matrix, but... Um, So all you have to do is take your column vector for S and then act on it with this matrix and you get up that. So when we get to linear algebra, by the way, as you're seeing, I'm kind of instinctively doing it, but you start working from right to left. So that's kind of the, the, the order that we do things according to proper matrix multiplication. Uh, and by the way, eta inverse, by the way, this is going from S prime to S. And any guess what that is? Just remove the negatives. So this just becomes positive gamma beta, positive gamma B, V. And again, that, that makes sense just because we're going in opposite directions. One sees a relative motion in the positive X, the other sees a relative motion in the negative X. So you literally just flip the sign. So it makes it easy enough. Uh, now, with that said, we can go a little bit further now, and we can look at what is the space-time invariant, or what is the space-time interval, we call it, now using this. Right, so we've kind of slightly formalized this, and we can now use um, matrix notation. I'll, I'll compactify it even a little bit more. I'm going to write this entire equation as um, x prime equals eta x, and more specifically, the way I'm going to write it is x mu times, I'm going to be just a tad sloppy, I'm not going to get any more formal than this, so x prime mu equals eta times x mu. Now, in that case, when I write x mu or x prime mu, this is really the same thing as so you're, this is going to look strange to you at first, but this also looked strange to you at first about a year or two ago when you first saw it. This is how we indicate this is a vector in 3D. This is how we indicate this is a vector in 4D space. And more specifically, 4D Minkowski space. That's literally all it means. By putting a little Greek letter mu there, um, it, when you go a little bit further, you'll see why this makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. But for now, all that means here is that this thing has now four components. One of them is CT. This thing has four components there. 
So think of it just as that little half arrow that indicates um, a, a vector. And if you want to get just a tad more formal, we properly then need to actually, this is, looks slightly different. This is what you'll see on general relativity texts. This is going to look like uh, we're going to have a superscript eta, mu, and eta there. Or I guess that's, that's nu, mu, nu. Uh, this is the exact equation that you're going to see in a general relativity text once you get to it that governs flat space-time and Lorentz transforms. Again, I'm encouraging you, don't worry about that, and this is how we're going to write it. So, with that said, we can now turn this into an even more efficient system of writing where I want to ask, what is the space-time separation? And remember, I'm going to write it as this, um, ds squared. So I think we used uh, delta s before. We'll use ds, and so I'll write like that, ds squared. And remember, what before what we had said is that we simply just defined it to be, um, and I'll, I'll remove the parentheses, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared minus ct squared. And that does need to be in parentheses there. And that should be cdt. So we had the spatial part squared minus the temporal. Space component squared minus the time component squared gives you this um, space-time invariant, or the space-time separation. And I'm going to pause it. Again, I'm going to just state without proof. Uh, the proof is actually really nifty, and this makes it a whole heck of a lot easier. But I'm going to say this is an invariant quantity in all frames, or in all reference frames. So it's an invariant quantity. It should be the same in all reference frames. So I should be able to change all of the x's into x primes, y's into y primes, t's into t primes, and so on. And what it means to be invariant in all frames is that they should all give the same answer. So no matter whose reference frame you're looking at, if you have two events or two intervals dx and dx prime that are related, they should all give that same answer. And we'll see why that, why that has to be true here in a second. But let's write this up and let's see how to actually calculate that based on our, our slightly more efficient um, uh, vector and, well, four vector notation. That's properly what these are. We have, uh, remember, x mu prime is the product of taking that eta matrix and multiplying it by x mu. So what I want to do, so, and by the way, you can do this the same for differentials, dx. So that's, instead of having a, a whole separation, you can have a small separation. And that's literally where this comes from here. And so now we have these differentials that are related by these, by this Lorentz transformation matrix. Um, by the way, we're getting really close to partial differential equations, which is the original language that Einstein spoke in, which is pretty fascinating that we've gotten that far here. Um, but so we have these two differentials that are related by that Lorentz matrix. And what I want to do is I want to say that ds squared, I want to take some dx mu, multiply it by some other dx mu. But here I want to use some matrix, and I'm just going to generically call that matrix M. And there's a reason why I'm calling it M. There, there's different, uh, different uh, letters that you'll see for that. So what I want is for the result of this is to take a matrix, or sorry, a row vector dx, dy, dz, cdt. I want to apply a 4 by 4 matrix, and then multiply it by, again, dx, dy, dz, dt. So 
CVT. And one thing that you'll see when you get to general relativistic notation, this will actually be dx mu with a superscript. This, this gets towards algebraic geometry notation. Again, I'm going to ignore that because we're just thinking it as a vector. So that's CDT again there, the last term. So I want some way to combine this. I want to take that, multiply it, bring it through. Dip, 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 dip. So now we have, uh, once we do that, this will end up having a 1 by 4, I guess it's 4 by 1 matrix, times this, a 4 by 1, dx, dy, dz, d, c, d, t. And then, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that gives us out a singular thing, a scalar. And that's what I want as what I'm calling ds squared. So this is precisely the mathematical machinery that I want to use. And do you see why this is a heck of a lot easier way to write that? And finally, all, all we have to do here is figure out what is that matrix that will help us do these calculations in any reference frame. And if you kind of think about it here, really what we want to do is we just want to take dx, not do anything, multiply it by dx. We just want to have a 1 there. So when we ask the question, what is m? This one here, it just needs to be a 1. We only want to take dx times 1 times dx. And that gets us out dx squared. The rest of those three have to be 0. We don't want a dx times any of those dy, dz, dt. So we have zero cross terms for any of these. And that tells us not only do we not want to have zeros there, 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 we actually don't want to have zeros anywhere off diagonal because if we did that, that would connect one of these to its non-similar one. It would connect the first to the second or the first to the third element. And we know that in this ds squared, we don't want to have a dx dy or a dx dt. So really that makes it easy. This one here just has to be multiplied by a factor of 1 times that, nothing else. That one there, factor of 1. So the last thing that we need, this needs to be multiplied by something there, times cdt. So here's what it looks like so far. And we know that those other three have to be non-zero, or that have to be zero, I'm sorry. So the only, the, the last part of the puzzle here is just a minus one. Take minus one, take dx and y, dx e, dt, c, dt, and then same thing. This right here is exactly what we call the Minkowski metric. And if you haven't heard the term metric before, um, it's, it's a very important term for mathematics, for quantum mechanics, for linear algebra, for geometry, for uh, general algebra. Anytime you're computing distances, you're using what we call a metric. So it's just a way of telling us if you have two points, how far apart those are. It's a way of connecting two points and outputting a distance. So the metric that we normally use in 3D space is the Euclidean metric. dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared equals length. What we now have is a very slightly different metric. It's Euclidean for the spatial part of geometry, but that minus sign is what tells us immediately it's no longer what we consider flat in, um, if you were to think of it in terms of like, Euclidean is flat. This is no longer Euclidean. So we'll, we'll talk about it like that. And specifically, whenever you take two distances and sandwich them with the Minkowski metric in between, the thing that you get out is the space-time invariant. And I've run out of time, so I'm not going to prove this. But here's the cool thing. Um, and I'm, I'm going to leave this as a, a problem to the reader. Prove 
that the Minkowski metric preserves space-time separations under the Lorentz transformations. That's what we'll pick up with on uh, the beginning of Monday's lecture. Um, it's a fascinating problem, so if you're actually able to, to show me uh, using specifically this notation, um, using the, the um, linear transformation notation, um, and that's the easiest way to do it, you can pretty quickly show that if you try to do a dx prime using this transformation, if you take that Lorentz matrix eta times dx, that's the same thing as dx prime. And you can take eta minus there, or maybe it's eta plus, I think, same thing, right there, put sandwich in between, the, that, that's converting both of those vectors, and that should conserve the space-time separation. So I'll prove that formally the next time. So I'm going to stop here.